Hi guys, my name is Eva and I'm going to be covering GI post-op complications today. Um, I recommend watching this in collaboration with the general perioperative care series because it can cover some more generic post-op complications and ask to see patient scenarios, whereas this is more focused on GI surgery post-op complications. So starting with a case, um, you're on a lower GI ward round and you've got a 65 year old man who has had a rectal cancer that's been cut out. So he's day four post a low anterior resection. And there's an image here as to um, what a low anterior resection is. Um, from the handover, you can see that he's got past medical history of diabetes, AF and a high BMI. He's also a smoker and those are the meds he's on. So already going into his room, you've got a bit of an idea of what kind of patient he is and risk factors for just poor outcomes, poor wound healing, etc. So you look at his notes. Main thing in post-operative patients, always look at the op note. Um, so the op note will tell you things like whether it was open, laparoscopic, where the incision site is and how they closed it, if they closed it. It'll tell you any intraoperative findings or complications and it'll normally give you an estimated blood loss so you can have an idea as to how much blood the patient lost during the operation. They'll also, in the post-op plan, mention of antibiotics or VT prophylaxis, um, which is important to act out on as a, as a junior looking after a post-op patient. Then looking at the anaesthetic chart is also really useful. So you can tell how stable their blood pressure has been through the, the operation and whether they've needed any fluids, any blood, any um, metaraminol. And that's all important information because if they've had a labile blood pressure throughout um, or they've had lots of bleeding, it might, um, well, it will worsen their outcomes post-operatively. Um, so looking at our patient, he's had minimal blood loss, no overt complications, and he's had a stable blood pressure throughout. On previous ward rounds, colleagues have said he's recovering normally post-operatively. There's not been any, any concerns or any early signs of deterioration. Going in to see our patient, he's telling us that He's always had tummy pain post-op, but today it's a lot worse and it seems to be all over as opposed to around the incision site. He's also feeling generally unwell, clammy and sick, although he's not actually been sick. Um, he's also not opening his bowels and hasn't passed flatus yet. Um, and he's got very minimal oral intake because of the nausea. He is passing urine though. So we do an A to E. Um, so his, his um, respiratory rate and saturations are okay and his chest sounds clear. Um, cardiovascularly, his blood pressure is a smidge on the low side and his heart rate is a smidge on the high side, which could just be a post-op pain response, but you're also in the back of your head thinking about dehydration, bleeding, infection, etc. Um, okay hydrated with a slightly raised cap refill time. Um, neurologically intact. And then examining his abdomen, um, he's got a distended abdomen. Um, he's tender throughout with some voluntary guarding, especially in his lower abdomen, but his dressing is intact and there's no strike through, so no blood on the dressing at all. I would say in general, the main things to look out for post-op, especially in GI patients, is to document the dressings, whether they're intact, whether there's any bleeding or any strike through. Sometimes these patients will also have drains and write down how many mils of blood or what, whatever there is serous fluid in the drain um, and then also documenting catheters being present and also how much urine is in them and what the urine looks like. Um, but so far we've just got a distended tender abdomen. Um, I forgot to mention as well he's not got any bowel sounds. So as a junior what plan would you make um, initially after assessing this patient? So. I would always recommend if you're concerned about a patient being unwell, do a VBG um, or ABG if appropriate. But um, here we can see his pH is okay, his HP is all right, um, although it'd be good to have a previous to compare with. And this is lactate that's mainly worrying. So he's got an increase in anaerobic respiration with the raised lactate, and that could indicate again dehydration, infection, sepsis, etc. So in this patient, I would probably make him nail by mouth. If you're not sure if a patient's starting to become unwell, might need theatre or you're worried about gut problems like ileus, I would just start by making them nail my mouth and rest the gut initially. Um, while someone's nail my mouth, you should be prescribing them fluids. Um, his blood pressure and heart rate is a bit up and down, so maybe you could give him a small bolus, see how he responds, and then prescribe him some maintenance. Um, always record fluid input output chart in these patients. Um, so you'll have a catheter in, which makes life a bit easier. Um, 
but if you didn't, you might be considering putting in a catheter. Then I would also be doing some bloods, check that HB again, make sure on formal bloods it's stable. Um, maybe send off a group and say, don't always assume there's an up-to-date one on the system. Um, just because someone's been to theatre, it may have just expired. Um, obviously, symptomatic management, antiemetics, analgesia. And then I would probably discuss this case with my senior and ask them, how worried should I be? Are there any further um, tests like imaging I could be doing? Um, you might be thinking about an abdominal x-ray um, versus a CT. Depending on how sick the patient is, sometimes seniors will want x-rays first, um, especially if you're worried about something like constipation, for example, which would show up, faecal impaction would show up on an x-ray and you don't need a CT for that. But if you're worried about more worrying pathology, then a CT is probably the go-to. Again, I would just discuss it with, with um, my senior. So this is a really busy slide. Um, and this is all on the cheat sheet, but I'm just gonna briefly talk through it now. So I'd say the most benign post-operative GI complication, also the most common, is constipation. And I would only really diagnose it after I've excluded everything else. Um, but because of opioids, um, reduced fluid intake, reduced fibre intake, um, and there's also a couple of other medications like ondansetron classically, um, it's very, very common for patients post-op to get constipated. Um, it's sometimes useful to do a PR exam because then you can see if they are impacted, if you can feel anything in the rectum, and then that would also mean that you could treat them with suppositories if there's something to feel in the rectum. Like I said, you can also see impaction on um, abdominal x-rays, you just see big dilated bowel loops um, with lots of stool inside them. And how you treat is just laxatives, suppositories, enemas, and do a review of the medications. So. Common, simple, but I would kind of leave that as a diagnosis of exclusion. Ileus is another very common post-op complication, especially in, in bowel surgery. Handling of the bowel can make it go to sleep, basically, post-operatively, commonly happening in day three to day five. Um, these are some risk factors, so lengthened handling of the bowel, bowel resection, some medications, um, and electrolyte derangements as well, so it's always important to do bloods in these patients. Um, often patients will not be opening their bowels, not be passing flatus, get quite distended and feel quite sick because of it as well. Um, and a CT is probably the investigation of choice in an ileus. So managing an ileus um, often is just conservative. So you rest their gut, make them nail by mouth and give them fluids in the meantime. Some of these patients need NG tubes if they're feeling really sick and vomiting. Um, and then also reviewing the medications they're on again that might be exacerbating it. So I think the most important um, complication that you always need to be thinking about is an anastomotic leak. Commonly on day three to day seven, but it can happen up to day 30, which is an early, early anastomotic leak, and after day 30, which is a late anastomotic leak. Um, and it's basically where, so you cut out a bit of bowel in the middle and you join the two bits of bowel together. And this join is called the anastomosis. And it's basically where it doesn't heal properly and effectively has a leak. And then the bowel contents leak out and basically cause peritonitis, uh, sepsis, these patients can be very, very unwell, and it's got a high mortality, so it's really important to be clued up on it. Um, the most common operations um, that increase your risk of an astomotic leak are low anterior resection and colectomies, and in these two operations, the complication rate can be as high as 20%. Other operations are esophagectomies and bariatric surgery, um, where you have an increased risk of an astomotic leak. Um, so, like I said, these patients often present quite dramatically, but it's always important, um, even for example, in our patient to be considering an anastomotic leak. And we may do a CT in our patient to ensure it's not that, um, because he's had quite a high risk operation. Um, risk factors include anything that predisposes you to poor wound healing, so diabetes, smoking, obesity, etc. And um, in these patients, um, they're often quite fluid deplete. They need antibiotics because they've got peritonitis. The fecal um, material from the bowel is now in the abdomen. And an anastomotic leak can cause, you know, long stays in hospital, long periods of, of gut rest needed. So we need to also think about um, nutrition. So a lot of these patients will end up on TPN. Um, 
And then in terms of managing it, so a small leak can be managed conservatively. Um, you can also use uh, do a procedure called an endosponge as well. When they're really sick um, and large unstable leaks, um, they just end up having a, a laparotomy. And the anastomosis has to either be made again or temporarily a defunctioning proximal stoma can be made to rest the rest of the gut um, and give it a better chance to, to heal once it's put back together again. And lastly, we've got wound dehiscences, um, which is effectively a breakdown of a wound. So the edges may come apart. Um, and in very severe cases, the um, abdominal contents can actually push through and protrude externally. And that will obviously need return to theatre. Or if it's just a um, break in the wound, wound opening, then sometimes you can um, suture them on the ward, depending on the type of wound and um, how deep it is. Um, more long term, similar to a wound dehiscence is an incisional hernia. So it's where as you're cutting through muscle, cutting through soft tissue to get down into the abdomen, obviously when it joins back up again, that's the weak point. Um, and especially in smokers, those with raised BMI, um, other risk factors, emergency surgery or people who've got a post-op wound infection, um, that can make it even more weak. Um, which means that over time, so months, years later, the abdominal contents can protrude into the abdominal wall and create a bulge, basically, in the abdomen. Now, these are managed very differently depending on where it is. So depending on location, some hernias can be a lot more um, at risk of stra strangulation or incarceration. Um, so they might be more likely to be managed surgically or if a patient's really, really symptomatic with it. Um, then that's also, we could consider surgery at that point, but it, it varies depending on the actual hernia itself. So for our patient, I would say it's really difficult to say which one of these post-op complications he could have, but I would always be thinking about an anastomotic leak, and it might be that um, a CT is the best option in, in, in our patient in order to rule out an anastomotic leak, and then we could maybe treat him for an ileus or post-op complication um, as above.